Amen, amen. You know, for when both my children decided to serve, I was like, how did we just become a military family? <laughs> I mean, I know in my family, we've had people, I know that uh, many of my mothers, uncles, who fought in World War II, who gave their life. Um, I, my dad served, my brother served, and suddenly these two kids decide to serve too. And yep, we're a military family, and it's just an honor. It's an honor, you know, for God and for country uh, as they have served. And today's scripture is in Mark. Yep, it's still here in the Gospels. And today's uh, reading is from 13, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. So hear the word of the Lord. As he came out of the temple, out of his disciples, uh, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great uh, buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was standing in, on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, when I was about three years old, I experienced my first natural disaster. And I have some memories of this. I remember one day waking up to the waters of the river over its banks and spilling out to our roads and up to the front of my house. I'm glad mom had a baby because it was very alluring to get in that water. You know, I have some you know vague flashes in my memory of that day, like my mom uh, telling me not to touch the dirty waters because there were little creatures in there that could come and bite me, that wasn't for me. I also remember that her picking me up and my brother and putting us on the couch and telling us, don't get off. At this point, the water had was coming into the house. And then, you know, um, I remember this getting on this truck, uh, that's a lot of pickup truck, and driving away, leaving everything behind, I mean, just, you know, and I was perhaps too young, but the experience was traumatic enough that I still remember, albeit in bits and pieces. You know, building up, once again, after we have hit rock bottom in our lives, it's one of the most difficult things to do in life. Just ask anyone who has lost their home by a hurricane or a tornado or a family who has just had to give their home to the bank because of foreclosure, or any of the victims of the recent uh, building collapse here in our own backyard. You know, when we watch such devastating events on TV, one wonders how will the survivors ever be able to start over? Today, as we continue our worship series titled, A Life That Matters, we continue with the scriptures that follow the events leading to Jesus' crucifixion. And as he and the disciples come in and out of Jerusalem, and after a visit to the majestic monument that is Herod's temple, Jesus brings his disciples' focus to the future. A future 
with thou that majestic temple in Jerusalem, a future that might seem grim at first, but regardless, a future of hope where everything is indeed in the hands of our Lord God, even when no one stone will be left standing. So let us pray. Oh, everlasting God, we thank you. We thank you because you have left for us these words. And this word is a lamp unto our feet. It is the light that shines upon our path. Thank you because you have made this available to us by the word of God, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask today that your Holy Spirit take these words and make them come alive in us so we can continue to be transformed as we are disciples ourselves who make other disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Mark has a thing. He shows us the 12 disciples in funny ways. You know, he seems to enjoy at times making them look silly at the drop of a hat. Have you ever noticed that? You know, here we have Jesus and the disciples wandering about around the big city like hillbillies or ibaritos or choritos or guajitos. Hey, I, I, I try to find all the words. I, I'm missing some of them, but you get the idea, right? And, and, and being on their first trip to New York City, if you've never been to New York City, you end up going like, oh, oh my goodness. And if there are clouds passing by, you go, whoa, I'm falling down. That's what was my experience when I was a kid. You know, and they, they are doing the same thing. They're looking up to the buildings and staring with their mouth wide open. Wow, look at all that. Damn, the, 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 look at those cool buildings. They're awesome. Yeah, the temple in Jerusalem was a sight to behold. It was huge, larger than anything most had ever seen in their lives. It was larger than Solomon's temple and built with large, white, polished stones and gold trimmings, real gold, let me tell you. And since it was built on top of a mountain, because Jerusalem was on a mountain top, whenever the sun hit it, in the morning or in the evening, anyone walking up to Jerusalem would stand in awe of the splendor and strength it conveyed. So you can imagine when the disciples, the disciples' disappointment, when Jesus didn't quite share their enthusiasm for his architecture and the design, or for the state and religious symbolism it represented. When questioned about the majesty of the building, he just said to just brush it all away. The conversation went something like this. Hey, do you see these buildings? Oh, well, dude, you know, I was just telling you that, you know. <laughs> well, these buildings, they will be gone before you know it. They will be brought down, destroyed. They will be soon just rubble and dust. No wonder. After hearing this, the disciples just remained quiet for a while. So as they continued to walk away from the temple grounds and head into the Mount of Olives, the apostle disciples wondered what was all that. So some of them decided to break the silence and approach Jesus in the garden and ask him, Hey Jesus, is there something we need to know? Like, is there a date that we need to keep in mind? Is there something we can put on our Google calendars to keep in mind? It? You know? As usual with Jesus, he answers a question with another question. Perhaps the question they should have asked in the beginning. See, they asked him, when? When, God? And I think this is one of our most common questions besides the why is the when. When? When will these things happen? When will I need to be in the right place, in the right relationship? When do I need to be right with God? You know, when? Well, when is not a question Jesus takes up. Probably because the answer tends to be not. Nah, but not nah, wait, 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 Pastor. What now? He 
Yeah. Why wait? Why put it up until the last minute and miss out on all the abundance of life and joy that there is in living right now, not just getting ready for the end of times after I have lived my life? Why wait until we finally have to, instead of doing now, what we should be doing? Jesus is telling them, pay attention. Pay attention to what is going on around you and what is coming down the road. Pay attention to what God is doing in your midst. Set your eyes on the hope. Do not live in fear. Live in faith. Whenever we come across uh, apocalyptic texts like this one, we don't really know what to do with them. We, you know, we wonder if we're supposed to encourage fear or issue warnings and threats with them. You know, sadly, that's how many see these texts. And perhaps many of us growing up in communities of faith that use uh, that use that uses texts as many others to scare people to believe in Christ, we have a problem with them. More recently, there has been this attempt at reinterpreting this text through book series and movies that present a great future, encouraging fear and issuing warnings about the end of times, when in reality, these books are just works of fiction that have taken up the scriptures out of context and just ran with them to Hollywood to exploit our human fears. What Jesus seems to be aiming at here is something different. If you have paid attention to Jesus' teachings, we see that he never uses fear as a tool. As a matter of fact, he is always rebuking the fear, even while he's gentle with the doubters. So I don't think he would have much time for those who play on fear as a method for getting people into believing in him. So with these words, Jesus tells his disciples to take the long view, to look beyond their current situation. He is saying, hey, why are you letting fear drown your hope? This isn't all there is. This, whatever this might be for you right now, doesn't define who you are and who you will be. There is more to come. There is an amazing life you can barely imagine and you can only glimpse from far away right now. And you don't have to wait for the end of the world to enjoy it. So instead of living in fear, Jesus wants us to watch out. Watch out whom we follow. Watch out who we attach our hopes to. There are some out there who might seem to have it all in, in, in all the answers. Have you heard them? You know, and offer a better tomorrow than the today that we find ourselves in. So be careful. There are those who will accept the mantle of leadership, but are only in it for themselves. So beware. Be aware. Watch whom you follow. And then, in verse 8, when stuff happens, yeah, that's the best way to translate most of verse 8. When stuff happens, that is only the beginning of birth pangs. And sorry guys, but you know, all of us who have been able to bear children, we have an idea of what those mean. Bird pants, that's a nice way to put it, yes. you know, are about. And yeah, it might seem like it's the end. It might seem even like it's the collapse of civilization as we know it. It might seem like the overthrow of all that's right and good. But Jesus says, we are just getting started. And the end is not as grim as we think. <coughs> You know, at times when the walls of our own lives that we have built up with so much effort, they just come crashing down. 
When the world that we have built for ourselves just crumbles before our eyes, it might seem like there is no hope for the future. That's sure how it seemed to my parents when they lost everything they had, and they didn't have much. They had been renting this very little wooden house and didn't have the slightest idea how to replace everything they had lost. However, they were not seeing us what God was doing in the background. You see, God was working, or they were worrying. And God was ensuring that we would have a house, our own house this time. We would not have to pay a landlord anymore. The government of my parents, a low interest loan with which they were able to build our house, the one that's still standing in Barcelona, in Puerto Rico. The issue with facing a seemingly dark future is that we tend to get caught in the moment. But Jesus is telling us to look beyond what our eyes can see. Yes, we can and need to appreciate every moment of grace and every act of love and service as they come, but we can't lose sight of the greater vision. We cannot take our eyes away from the promise of better things to come, even when it doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. When Jesus speaks about the end of today's, his intention is not scaring us into believing, but helping us to keep things in proper perspective. We cannot get wrapped up in the stones of the life that we have built or the ones that others have torn down. We cannot get hooked on the apparent safety that this world might give us, the apparent safety of, of jobs, of, of a government that seems to have everything in control, of the safety of money in the bank. You know, one day all of that will come crumbling down. One day all of that will be no more and all we will be left with is rubble. So what do we hold on to? What can we place our faith in? What's really enduring when all this is not trustworthy? Well, today Jesus offers us something that we can stand on. Something more valuable than our 401ks. Something stronger than society's institutions. Something more lasting than anything we can build. Something that really matters. And that is a kingdom. God's kingdom. And scripture says that that kingdom is a kingdom of prosperity, of love, of peace, of joy, the Holy Spirit. A kingdom that is eternal. One that has, that is not a far away hope in heaven. That's not the kingdom, but a reality that is right here with us. Have you paid attention every time we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer? We ask for heaven to come down to us here to earth. Yes, every time we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be all done on earth as it is in heaven. We're asking for God's heaven, for God's kingdom to come down to us. Every time we pray this prayer, we ask for the reality of God's eternal love, peace, joy, hope to become a reality in our midst. And that's what we, the church, that's our job right here. And this is not a prayer that should remain in our lips. As we pray for that kingdom to become a reality in our midst, we are called to engage in acts of justice that bring peace to people, in acts of mercy that will bring joy and hope as we all walk humbly in the presence of our God and one another. That right there. That is a life that matters. A life that does not allow to be led astray by what our ears hear or what our eyes can see, but by the hope of a God who broke into our history to make this a reality. That, right there, is the goal of our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. To make God's kingdom a reality in our midst. And how do we do that? We've been talking about that all along, by loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
and our neighbor as ourselves. I know that the idea of losing everything we hold on to is scary beyond compare. That is why it is a challenge for us Christians in North America to see, to set our eyes beyond everything that doesn't provide instant verification. Yeah, we are the microwave and Google era people. We have been accustomed to have things just come right to us. So beware, be aware, keep watch, resist, hold out for what God is doing and will do. And even when it seems that there is no end in sight, when what we hold on as true and permanent is no more, we can live in hope, in the hope that God will once again make things right and rescue us. That right there is what God's justice is all about. Yeah, God is in control. We just need to place our trust where it belongs. And that is one of the reasons that we need to come to the table of the Lord every time we come together. Because I don't know if you have noticed, but the table of the Lord is the place where we can actually do our reset. This is the reset button in our lives, right? We come here on Sundays and we go, oh Lord, what a week. Oh Father, forgive me. If you notice on your way coming in today, uh, we placed the baptismal font out in the front and we put water in it and left the lid open. One of my professors in seminary, a very funny one, he said, you know what? I love having water in that water pump all the time. Because there are times that I just miss the target, mm -hmm. that I just sin, and I need to be reminded of my baptism. Mm -hmm. I need to be reminded of what God did for me. And he said, I just go there and splash some of that water in my face and go, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. I completely forgot. And baptism is not the only place. Communion, the communion table is that place where we come to celebrate